Okay. We have a couple in, a couple introductory slides, and then we'll I'll go over uh, a couple of the cases that I have, and then Mary will go, do some of hers, and then I'll go. We'll kind of go back and forth. So, um, so tonight, uh, the big question is: What is a brick wall? What is brick wall in genealogy? This is a research problem. Basically, it has dead ends where you have spent many hours of doing research, not finding anything. Uh, brick walls could be uh, going and finding uh, things that basically stay a brick wall for practically ever. Some things can be cracked, other things cannot. Um, some things are rather simple, some things are very complex. Um, when you're not finding anything, it's possibly that you uh, need to look in other avenues, need to look in other locations, need to look around the people, uh, use the, the terminology that we use in the, in the field called fans, friends, associates, and neighbors uh, to help you with your brick wall research. Could be that the county has uh, burnt records and uh, the ideals of not finding anything you may not find anything. Um, so the big thing with doing this type of research is make sure that you have enough detail in your research uh, that will help um, others to be able to help you. Uh, the other thing is if you're helping someone brick, uh, solve their own brick wall and they've gone and say, I've looked here, I've looked there, I've looked there. What you want to do is you still want to go back and re-verify that information. Uh, do your own homework. Uh, because sometimes things are missed. Things are overlooked. Things are misinterpreted. So th that's the the main thing with these brick walls. Mary, you have anything to add? Um, I just want to remind everybody that we're recording this for replay um, on our YouTube channel for the Historical Society. So if any time you feel we're entering into something you don't want to discuss on a recording, please let us know um, and we'll respect your privacy that way. Uh, this is intended to be a class for sharing. We, and we will, but we will respect your privacy. What should be in the research problem? What should be in the brick wall? Uh, the problem should be Pacific. What is known about the person? What is not known about the person? Where have you looked? List all your sources. What questions would you like answered? Uh, a question as towards, I would like to know everything about James Smith is not a question. It's, it's too of an open-ended question for someone to be able to research it needs to be more specific and uh, to a specific type of thing. Like, I would like to know when he died or about when he died. And if you know where they lived, uh, when he lived, that would be helpful. Uh, a lot of times you see on different genealogy boards, people posting questions, but they're not specific enough for people to be able to help them. So you want to be able to provide others enough information to be able to quickly look for things because not having specific information um, could be crucial. Uh, you have hundreds of years of records and knowing the Pacific time frame would help a matter of looking at Pacific location rather than wasting time. Um, I know many times Several times we have people coming to the historical society that uh, 
trying to get enough information out of them so we know uh, they're looking for something in the 1700s, more than likely it's not going to be sitting in our vertical files. It's going to be sitting in uh, possibly court records or uh, published books sitting on the shelf rather than sitting in a vertical file or the court record sitting in a safe. So, um, so as much information as possible, as much documented information as possible. I mean, sometimes there's family lore that may be helpful. Uh, so, so the first case tonight that I'm gonna go over um, that was sent in uh, was on a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Hamilton. Now, uh, Jonathan Hamilton first appeared here in Hartford County in living here in 1776 in Broad Creek 100 here in Hartford County. And uh, what they're looking for is his parents. Um, now we have both a Hamilton family and a Hamilton family, which is spelled this way with Hamilton as well as H-A-M-B-L-E-T-O-N is the other surname. And one of the big things that to look for is the, the regular records that a normal researcher would look for. Church records, land records, wills, probate records, other type of court records. However, there are several different Hamilton families in Harford County at this time in Harford County history. So in this period of time, there's a, a lot of areas that you would need to cover in order to uh, rule out or rule in a Pacific person. So what, what, what I was able to locate was uh, in our loose court records that we've had, which came from the courthouse uh, over 40 years ago, um, we have all the loose papers from the courthouse um, spanning from 1774 up until uh, the early part of the 20th century. Um, and what, we, what I was able to locate uh, was two uh, time frames of when Jonathan Hamilton appeared in these court records, once in 1785 and once in 1802. That's the only time he ever appears. Now, this is after the time when he appeared in 1776 census. Now, at this current moment, all this is basing this off of is a name. This is not verifying that this is the same person that appeared in the 1776 census, but it's possibly the same person or it's possibly that it's a person that just happens to have the same name. Chris? So what was that? Chris? What? I also found him in Harford County Wills, the book by Morgan. Um, okay. He was a co or a witness for John Wyman's will. And Okay. I also found him in um, another book, hold on, uh, Dr. John Archer's First Medical Ledger by Henry Beeden, and he's in here okay. as a patient. Okay, so there is no, so what I also looked at, it was the land record index. He is not in the land record index whatsoever. Um, he, uh, these two loose papers that were found um, were actually um, the one he was listed uh, as a debtor uh, owing to the estate of Ignatius Wheeler. And the other one is another uh, debt case as well, uh, where he is listed as owing money uh, to a specific person. So those are only time, two times that he shows up in the records that we have that have been indexed uh, 
in the loose court papers that we have at the Historical Society. Now, we may have other things at the Historical Society uh, in the loose court papers that have not been um, indexed yet. Uh, when these came to us over 40 years ago, they were in boxes. Uh, you could have records from 1785 sitting on the top. The next thing on, on the thing was 1805. Everything was thrown in boxes. There was no rhyme or reason of how they put this in boxes. So, uh, and then it was put into folders as it came out of that box, put into folders. So you could go through five, six, 10 files before you actually get the entire case. Um, and then a numbering system was done for each folder. So um, until the historical society, we do have a research service by mail that you're able to utilize at the current moment. Um, currently, the Historical Society is not open to the public. Uh, and Mary can address that later on at the end uh, when we uh, get towards the end about what what the, the goals are for that down the road um, at the current moment. So Mary, uh, as toward this one, this one asking about the parents of Jonathan uh, Hamilton, this is a more of a complex issue. Uh, this is going to take a lot more than uh, an hour or so of research to basically rule out other people with similar names, uh, similar last name, to figure out which family he actually belongs to, especially when you have a lack of records um, uh, in this period of time. Uh, of course, this is during the beginning of the American Revolution, so a lot of things are missing. Uh, we do have a period of time when things have, are missing. So, um, so uh, other than that, this one is basically unsolvable at the current moment. So, uh, Mary, would you like to tackle one? Sure. Um, Michael Kraus, you can unmute. Michelle Kraus. Is it Michelle or Michael? My name. My name is Michelle. But okay, but you asked about Michael. Michael. Yes. Okay, and um, you, for some reason I don't have your question, but you you have a, a Michael Krauss in Bavaria, Germany, about April 1821. Yes. And you were looking for a baptismal certificate. Do you do you not have World on Ancestry? I or did. You do. I have not been able to get either immigration or anything in Germany on him. I have extensive records here. Okay, because I, I found a baptismal certificate for April 26, 1820 in um, Bavaria, Germany for Michael Kraus. And it lists the father as Paolo, P-A-U-L-O, Kraus and the mother as Katharina, C-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-A, -A, Gruber. Um, family History Library, number 367701. I'm sorry, Mary, could, could you repeat the date, 18? April 26, 1820. 1820. Okay, so that puts him a year younger than I thought. And family yes. history record is um, the family and the family history library file film number is three six seven seven zero one. Okay. Now, everybody, I'm I'm going to talk about a trick. Um, if you have ancestry and you want to search a certain location. Okay, when you go into search, right, go to the bottom and you'll see a, a menu there to choose a specific country or state. Okay, and you can click on like Germany and then all the records Ancestry have from Germany will be all that you're searching. You're not searching the whole uh, gambit of what 
ancestry has to offer. You're being more specific to the country. And uh, that using that little trip, that's how come I came up with it. Um, again, uh, the birth date seemed to match from what Michelle told me and um, the name and the location, Bavaria, Germany. And this was an index. It was not a, a, birth, a baptismal certificate. So it was just an index. And, but it's something you can work with, I think. And uh, so there you go. And um, if you want me to, I'll mail these to you, Michelle. I would, I would appreciate an email of, of that, just in case I copied something down incorrectly. Okay, okay. Mary, was there anything other than the dates and the name that looked reasonable to prove um, Paolo and Katharina as his parents? Um, it's an index again. So that's the only information that was there. The baptismal place was Vinigan, V-E-N-N-I-N-G-E-N, -N -N -N, Bavaria, Germany and the birth date, and that it was a male named Michael Krause. The only other thing I got was a picture of a, a, a two, two tombstones in a cemetery. Um, one was Krause, and right behind it was Gruber. So um, that I could not get a copy of, but uh, it and I couldn't verify that there was a Paolo or a Katerina buried there. It was just a picture of a tombstone. Is this in Germany? Yes. Okay. I've, I've visited Michael's grave. He's buried at Most Holy Redeemer here in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. The other, the other thing is, when did he die? He died July 2nd, 1901. Have you checked the uh, German newspaper in Baltimore? Yes, I have the German uh, Der Deutsche Correspondent and a nice long uh -huh. uh, German, and we transcribed it. I have a friend who's fluent, and it didn't give any leads aside from a, okay. a approximate uh, immigration. Um, I think it was, oh, I can't remember. It, it, it gave a, not a year, but when he was 20 or something like that. Okay. Okay, Chris, right, Mary, you want to do another? Um, is Joellen Bledsoe one? Joellen? Hold on, I have people coming in there. Okay. Hold on. Wait a minute. Chris, can you take take it down from uh, sh screen sharing? Or no? Yeah. Okay, who we got? Oh, Joe, okay. Um, Mark's still on here. Deb Record, is she on here? Yes. Ah, Deb. Okay. You, your question was in reference to the wife of Vito Costa. Correct. Okay, and I'll admit in the beginning, I was a little confused because um, I found um, the Rosa and then I found Antonia. Right. Okay, okay, and then I realized that Rosa had passed away and he had remarried. Right. Now, the wonderful thing you got going for you that I could not... Um, access you're going to have to access is the fact that Vito had a railroad pension. Right. 
and I sent you um, his social security number and the claim number. Right. And he only has, according to the website, in order to apply for those records, um, he only has to be passed away for about seven years. Oh, okay. Uh, so you should be able to do that. And if you look at the example of the railroad pension records you get, they show where the checks were being sent. Oh. And, and when the beneficiary passes away, the funeral home has to fill out a form and send it into the um, pension company. So okay. you'll have uh, where she lived, where she died, and where she's buried. All we know is that we know she went to Canada. Right. To live with a sister. So right. they would have... So it was, they would have been mailing those checks to her in Canada until she passed away. More than likely. Okay. Okay. You, when this comes in, you'll, you'll have a gold mine of information on her. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Okay. Chris, next. All right. Okay. I'm going to go back to the screen. Okay. Okay. All right. Is Mr. Ford on the on the call? I don't think he is. Um, Don Ford sent an inquiry in, uh, and what he was looking for was uh, the parents of a James Ford and his wife Blanche uh, West, who were here in Hartford County. Um, they first appeared in the 1776 census here in Hartford County. Um, he was 22, she was 23. And then they had a uh, infant daughter uh, with them as well. Um, one of Mr. Ford's relatives uh, had spent many years doing research uh, on this family and both of them came up uh, empty handed. Um, and these are very common names, uh, both in the colonial period of Harford County. Uh, there's multiple West families, there's multiple Ford families. So unfortunately, this type of case uh, and this common of last name uh, takes a lot more research than uh, time allowed for. Um, so it, it's one of these things where it's, it, uh, they did not leave any uh, any land records with either of their names on it. Um, James Ford uh, served in the American Revolution, and then they went west. Uh, so they were not here very long. Um, so it's a matter of figuring out which, which other families they could have connections to. Um, also by their, especially with his wife Blanche's name, there's other family, Pacific families here in Harvard County which have the name Blanche in their family during that period of time. And a lot of times that, that's able for you to specifically look at Pacific families that carry down Pacific names. Uh, for example, when you're doing colonial Maryland history uh, research uh, in different areas of the state, you have Pacific first names that are carried through uh, uh, in, in different areas of Maryland during the colonial period, like the name Aquila. Uh, is, is very popular up here in, in the northeastern part of the state where um, other names, for example, even last names uh, too as well are more popular in the northeastern part of the state than uh, other areas. For example, Claggett. Claggett is a, is a uh, PG Montgomery County uh, area family. Um, so especially if you have family that have gone west and all you have is the state of Maryland uh, as 
in a census record, you don't know which of the twenty, which of the counties your ancestor was actually from. So, um, so a lot more re detailed research would need to be done on this type of a case um, in order to f figure it out um, and, and actually rule out other people with the same name, especially the name of Ford, name of West, are, are very common names here in the county at the, at the given time. So um, church ones we can rule out, but the problem is there, there are too many of them that we would have to do uh, within the time to allow. So the next case I have is on Thomas Ayers. And I believe this case was for this for was it Lori Ryan? Who asked about Thomas Ayers? Okay, I don't know if they're, okay. Um, so uh, this individual uh, was looking to join uh, the Order of the First Families of Maryland. And of course, the Order of the First Families of Maryland is a lineage society. Uh, just like with any lineage society, you have to be able to document your ancestry back to a specific individual uh, that qualifies you for membership in that group. So uh, what this person was able to do was trace her ancestor back to a Thomas Ayers born in uh, St. Paul's Parish area of uh, Kent County in 1724. However, in order to join the group, uh, you have to uh, be able to trace it uh, a generation further. Uh, in this case, um, research has been done by numerous people um, trying to identify who this Thomas Ayers' his father is, uh, and different people came up with different scenarios of who they suggested that it was. Um, now, in some cases, that can happen. People have different uh, scenarios. However, there's only one scenario that actually has the actual proof. So uh, the actual correct proof, I should say. So what I was able to locate um, in this was several years ago, a book was written. Uh, there was a, several volumes done uh, on the colonial families of the Eastern Shore of Maryland. There were 24 volumes of this publication done. It covered families all up and down the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, usually the, the colonial families of the Eastern Shore usually covered pre-1800, uh, possibly pre uh, and sometimes pre-American Revolution, so pre-1775. So the col early colonial period, 1634 to about the revolution, sometimes they took it up to about 1800. Now, this appeared in actual volume one that was written many years ago uh, by uh, the late Bob, uh, Robert Barnes, who just recently passed away, uh, and F. Edward Wright, who's, who's still living. And what they were able to write about this heirs family, and they actually used original records, were able to pull, we can actually go and pull those actual references uh, that they have. Uh, and the references are, if you can see my mouse, are right underneath of each of the paragraphs. And we can actually go to those original records and pull those, and those would be acceptable for the order of the first families that the individual is joining. Uh, uh, that would hold, the actual documents would hold more credence than the compiled work. Now they can submit the compiled work, but the actual documents would, would be better to use.
The next case is on Margaret Shook. Um, the person on the on the line that asked about Margaret Shook. I believe I saw them on here. Okay. Um, what was known about Margaret Shook Phillips Shipley? She was born in 1915 in Baltimore, and she died in, I believe, it, 1994. Uh, yeah, 1984. Um, so what they knew about her, uh, she lived most of her life in Baltimore. Uh, her mother died before she was 10. Uh, mother's maiden uh, name was Shook never knew what her first name was, um, did not know her father, but it was said that her, the father was a black stock uh, as a last name. Uh, she went to live with her Aunt Matt. Um, also, there was also a Scannell family involved as well. So what the person wanted to know was, uh, was her mother Nellie Shook? Was the individual Margaret Shook illegitimate? What records of unwed mothers are there in 1910? And how can we determine conclusively who her father was because her DNA is connecting her to a Blackstock family? So when, when a researcher looks at this, the first thing we look for is was a birth certificate ever issued for this individual? So the first place that I looked because they lived in Baltimore was the birth index for Baltimore City. And what I found was a birth index for a child born to a uh, Nellie Shook and a Benny Blackstock. Now, the way that this was written was it said Nellie Shook and Benny Blackstock. Now, if the couple was married, it would say Thomas and Mary Jones and would not give the mother's maiden name in the birth index. So when it actually labels it under the mother and then gives the father's name, that means that the person was illegitimate. The child was illegitimate. So because this record was created over a hundred years ago, I was able to obtain it. So what this record is telling us is that the child was born on that given date. The child was born to Nellie Shook, a 19 year old white uh, individual uh, who was involved with housework, born in Maryland, um, said she was uh, living on Exeter Street in Baltimore. And the father was a Benny Blackstock his residence was unknown. He was white, 23, born in Virginia, and he was an engineer. This would explain why, why she's matching the Blackstock family. This would also, the certificate also explains uh, the legitimacy of the birth, which means the question is, uh, was it legitimate? And the answer is no. Um, so, and it also says one here, how many children has the mother had and how many are living? Uh, and the answer is one in one. So in this type of, and the child was born in John Hopkins Hospital. Uh, so in this, in this type of case, um, the mother knew who the father was. However, she had at the time when the child was born, 
They did not know where the father was. They knew basically how old he was, where he was born, and what he said his occupation was, but they did not know where he was from. I mean, I'm, I mean where he was living at the time when the person was born. Now, uh, the other question was about unwed mothers. Um, this is a type of question that would probably have to be, I have to research a little further to figure out, uh, but it, it's kind of tricky to define records on that, especially that period of time. Um, but a lot of the other questions that she's asking, we were able to somewhat solve and at least confirms her DNA suspicion uh, with the with matching the Blackstock family, which actually is a Virginia family. So uh, it, it basically verifies a lot of what uh, what she had. So um, that'll be uh, given to that individual. So so the the next one is. Uh, I'll talk about in a moment. So, Mary, do you want to do one? Mary, you're muted. Is Joellen Ingram on? Oops. Okay. Don't see him. Okay. Mark. Is he still here? Oh. Hi, Mark. Can you unmute? Okay. Mark. Okay. Mark's question involved a Sarah Ann Sipes, 1841 to 1912. And he wanted to know who the parents were. Sarah is his third great grandmother. And I found a death certificate, just like you did, that listed her father as Jacob Sipes. The problem I ran into is that every Jacob Sipes that I found had the wrong age to be Sarah's father. They were either 10, 11, 12, or younger. And um, I went through quite a few uh, Jacob Sipes. There was one that was thrown from a buggy and killed in... Um, uh, Kentucky, but again, the age was wrong. He was only 57 in 1887, and that would have put the age way too low. So there are a lot of Jacob sites out there, and there are no death certificates at that time for what may have been her mother. And they moved around, it seemed they moved around a lot. They were um, Ohio, Kentucky, different areas, and Indiana. And uh, so I'm not, I have not tracked down anything on who it is, but I know who it isn't. And um, that was all I was able to accomplish with uh, an hour of research. Mark still there? Okay. He's unmuted. Is he unmuted? Mark, I'm are sorry, you I meant muted. I'm sorry. Mark, are you there? <laughs> okay. I know we can't un unmute him, so. Um, is Joe Ellen Ingram on? 
Nah. Uh, Joellen's question was in reference to her fifth great grandfather, Stephen Reed. And this one is an indication of what a small world we live in because her great, fifth great grandfather served under my fifth great grandfather, Nathaniel Van Oy. And I really wanted to talk to her. The, uh, a lot of the problems with brick walls are when records were started. For example, in the, in the counties where we searched, uh, in North Carolina, birth records were started in 1913, marriage in 1747, death in 1913, <clears throat> court records in 1715, land in 1678, probate in 1694, and census in 1784. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have to start looking when you you have to start looking at what records were kept when. Also, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Ash County had a fire in their courthouse in 1865. <clears throat> Chris, can you take over and I'll come back later? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Okay. All right, moving on. Okay, Joe Kilborn, I know you're on the call. Because I know you were just eating some dinner. Yes, I was, Chris. Um, I'm all done now. All right. Um, your your inquiry was on uh, David Harold, uh, and can, can you pronounce the last name? It's Charlotte, S-H-A-L-I-T, just like C-H-A-R-L-O-T-T-E, Charlotte, just spelled differently. So, okay. So what you were looking for, it, my understanding is you cannot find him on the passenger list? Correct. Okay, so from what you wrote, you, you had previously looked for this on other path or other ways. Yep. Okay, so fortunately, what uh, what's actually going on here, which which Joe more than like uh, already knows, is. Uh, uh, David is is uh, um, Jewish, and a lot of times what's happening here is they're coming under, coming over under another similar uh, surname. Um, for example, David's brother came under a different surname, um, and. Uh, which was the uh, the surname, which was the maiden name of uh, of their mother, right, um, right? And a lot of right, a lot of times what happens here, or they when they come over, uh, the officials try to Americanize the person's name, so we're not really a hundred percent sure of what their uh, actual name coming over here actually was. So one of the things that I think Joe actually already did, which I actually thought of, which it, uh, me, me actually doing it would be kind of meaningless if Joe already had done this, is, uh, is uh, when David on his naturalization record he said that he had came to Boston um, uh, on July 6th. He arrived in Boston on July 6th, 1877. So the first thing that I would look for is every ship that ported into Boston on that Pacific date. 
And I believe Joe already has done that. So that would be the first thing that I would do. Um, uh, am I correct with that assumption? Uh, no, because I, I've not been able to find a listing of ships by dates. In other words, okay. I, I can't, I can't go to, a, I, I haven't been able to find a list of where I could go for 1877 and the month of July and the day of six, the sixth day to find if any, even if any ships arrived that day. Right. I know there is a list for New York. We, we were able, when I, when I had done this for someone else, I was able to do that reversely for someone else, but that was based out of New York. Right. That was not uh, only, that was not for Boston. Right. So probably one of the big places that I would do research, uh, I would gear my research at, for this type of stuff uh, is the New England Historical and Geological Society, which I believe you've already been to right? Um, in the past. Right. Um, so they're the first ones that I would go to because they're the uh, basically the powerhouse of, of, of that type of um, that area of the United States. Um, and, and as more things come online over, since over the last few years, uh, things may be there, but the problem being, like I said before, uh, with him coming over more than likely under a different name uh -huh. and mm -hmm. then Americanizing, Americanizing it later on, makes it kind of hard. Um, when, when did he, I don't have my notes in front of me, when did he actually get naturalized? Um, wait a minute, let me see if I can a process. figure that. Um, here it is, naturalization record. Oops, it's not coming up to show me. Oh. Um, and I can't, I can't bring it up on them. Okay. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't I bring what you wrote, but I'm trying, work, I'm trying to work my phone, Chris, so I don't have to leave the. Okay. So, okay. So, the big thing is, what I would do is, um, do, do you have a membership with the New England Historical and Genealogical Society? No, but the um, Boston Jewish Genealogical Society resides in the building, believe it or not. So, okay. So I don't know whether or not, that, you know, that, visit, if you visit the Jewish Genealogical Society, whether or not I'd be able to also, you know, visit the... Them. But I've, yeah, I, I believe you can go in there and do research for a day yeah. um, and, and just pay like an entry like you would do if you would be coming into the historical society. Um, and, and it's it, it's one of those things where uh, it's basically in this type of research, especially with Jewish genealogy, is keeping an open mind. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Especially with yep. the name change. Yeah. Um, the name changing. Um, also, uh, I did find what you wrote. And of course, he, uh, uh, David had a habit of having different birthdays. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so that, that's another thing when, when you may be trying to figure out to rule somebody out uh, in this type of case, I wouldn't really suggest doing that unless you have a really good valid reason of ruling them out, especially when he's all over the board um, with, with, with his age. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it, it's one of these things where it's keeping an open mind, uh, especially doing this type of research. Um, when, you, when you least expect it, that to be the person, that's probably more than likely the person. Um, the, 
the one least one you least think that it is. So uh, my suggestion is to, uh, when you have time, to either uh, once things start opening back up or to send a written request up there to Boston to see if they're able to help you. Um, I know they're doing some stuff remotely up there. Um, so with uh, being able to ask questions, uh, I know uh, one of the researchers up there, David Lambert, mm -hmm. uh, does a um, people submit questions and he tries to answer them and things. So uh, as well as uh, another one up there, uh, Chris Child and Gary Boyd Roberts and several others yeah. so, that I've known over the years. So um, it, it's a very complex issue, um, uh, but it's it, it, it possibly that it can be solved. It just takes a lot more, a, a little more digging in things. Yeah. So yeah, it might um, pop up someday because I couldn't find his brother Abraham for a long time, and then not just all of a sudden he popped up on a passenger list. So right, you know, but that's. That's quite common using a different name, especially yeah. the, like, for example, the, the brother yeah. used the mother's maiden name. Right. Um, and then, and then what was the, was he known by Silverman for the rest of his life? No, no, he, uh, Henry was the known, he came in as Heinrich Silverman, and uh, he's known the rest of his life as Henry Charlotte. Yep. Yeah. He, uh, right. he had a uh, clothing store in Salem, Massachusetts, and he had a clothing store in Lynn, Massachusetts. So, you know. Mm -hmm. But more than likely, you're not going to find, a, you're not going to find a name change in court. Um, there, or more than likely, you're not going to have those type of records. Right. So, no, I'm sure that uh, when, he, when he landed, he, uh, you know, he, because I think, I remember right, Henry was going to visit, um, I think it's, I think his brother, I think he was going to visit Abraham, but I'm not sure on that. I'm not, you know, positive. Okay. But. So, so it's just one of these things. It's like, it's yeah. almost like having an alias. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just like the men that served in the civil war that had aliases. Um, so for whatever reason, they decided to use yeah. a different name. Yeah. So, I've got uh, uh, one other, one other brother was, and a I, sister. So. You know, well, thanks a lot, Chris. I appreciate that. Sure. All right. Uh, I'll go see if I have another one. Um, is a person online that asked about Barnaby? Yes, that's me, Becky. Okay. Becky Clark? Yes. Okay. So uh, the question that you asked was, where can I find other information online uh, or in uh, our records about Barnaby Conley, uh, who lived here in Hartford County uh, from at least 1743 until 1777 when he died? Um, when I went through your inquiry, uh, you, you've done a lot of already uh, the grunt of the research already. So there was no use going through that material. Uh, you went through the church records, you went through the probate records. Um, and of course, uh, when, when Barnaby died in 1777, an account was issued in 1778. And then there was another account issued later on in the uh, 1780s. Um, uh, so he actually has two uh, estate files filed in Harford County. So uh, not just one, but he actually has two. And then later on, um, in I believe 1802, there's a distribution filed um, in um that we also have as well that name his uh, widow and his uh, six daughters. So uh, basically the online things that we would have, uh, you haven't looked at it already, is the Maryland, is the land records for Hartford County are online 
at Maryland Land Rec, uh, mdlandrec.net, um, and that's run by the Maryland State Archives. That covers all of the Maryland land records for all 23 counties and the city of Baltimore starting in 1634 up until last week. Are those, all are that those available? Information. Do you have to have a sign on to get to those records or uh, can you get to you them? Have to have a sign. You have to have a sign on and it is free. Okay, I do um, have a sign on. Just, I just didn't know how to look there. Okay. Right, it's a little, uh, it's, it may be that uh, in the near future we do a, uh, a talk about how to use it because uh, with some of the counties, it's a little complicated um, on how to use the index and then actually go and pull the books up. And some of the counties are actually more complicated than others. So that may be a talk that Mary and I will consider in the future, um, in the near future, uh, on how to do that. Um, if it's further out, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you a step-by-step -step guide with pictures on how to pull things up. Um, that would be great. The other, so the other thing that we have available uh, that I talked about a little bit earlier is the Historical Society obtained a lot of the loose court papers uh, from the courthouse when the courthouse was expanding um, and they were running out of room. And a lot of the loose court papers that we have are um, so-and-so stole my cow, trespass cases, uh, disputes with different things. Um, these records go all the way back to 1774 when the records start all the way until the early part of the 20th century. Um, however, when they started indexing these things over 40 years ago, they they had no rhyme or reason of how they were doing it. They basically would open one box, pull stuff out of it, unfold it, transcribe the names, put the names on cards, and then put the papers in a file and then name and then label each page. Their own they had their own recording system. Um, so say there was 10, 15, 20 pages to this case. You may have five pages in one folder. You may have another 10 or 15 pages of it. If there is another 10 or 15 pages of it in a totally different folder, that's say folder number eight and the other half of it sitting in number, folder number 76 or number 102. So um, so the, uh, the filing and the transcribing of names off these documents is still occurring um, 40 years later. Um, They're writing these on paper and then someone is transcribing that name information into a computer that is then inputted uh, into a file and put on our past perfect software, which is on our website, um, which is on our past perfect catalog. However, that past perfect catalog is only updated uh, at certain times. So um, that's what is being done now. Um, prior to that, the things were put on three by five cards, which is only accessible in the historical society. And those run from about uh, 1774 to about 1830 period, but Again, there's still boxes and stuff in different spots that you could still find 1774 stuff still sitting in a box that hasn't even been opened or touched, and it's still in its twine and never been opened. So um, I haven't been in, back into the Stroke Society to see if there is anything on Barnaby, uh, but it, it, if there is, it's probably not going to be much. Um, especially since he's in the early period. Um, it, it may be a few things here or there. It may be witnesses to things. There may be other, other type of things, but unless I, until I get in there to look, I'm not going to know what I'm going to be finding. Um, and of course, he 
he's known in Barnaby, he's known in Barney. Um, so, and of course, with Conley, they've spelled that a few different ways as well. Right. So, um, a couple of so questions. that's what I would. You said sure. something about 1802, a distribution file. Was that something I had told you I had found, or was that something you did find? You I don't remember that. if you found it or not. Um, it listed his wife um, and his six daughters. I, I have a I have a baptism file on the wife and six daughters. That isn't what you were referring to, though. Are you in 1802? No. Um, the um, the distribution file was um, back in the 1990s. Uh, let, let me clear the screen. So let me cut the screen a minute. Um, okay. Back in, uh, uh, let's see, when was this? Well, 2000. Um, I don't know if you see this book. Uh, Henry Peden wrote a book called uh, Heirs and Legatees of Harford County from 1802 to 1846. Um, I I then picked it up in 1846 and then uh, up to um, 1864. So um, in the, all this was, was basically him going through the distribution uh, that are um, actually today on um, family search on the distribution books that, are, that were originally at the Register of Wills office, which are now at the Maryland State Archives. So he had gone into the Register of Wills office and transcribed all of the uh, names out of the distribution cases. Um, and there is a case there for um, Barnaby. Now, what Can happened me? was, go ahead. Can you send me that page um, where you found it? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. I can thank you. I can send you the originals. Okay, great. That would be great. I have, I have the original as well. So um, what had happened was because he had died in the early part of the, um, of the county, for whatever reason, these files, these distributions, uh, were put into the um, – a minute – into the uh, – estate files. However, they were never transcribed into the books, into the distribution books until later. And then something happened where uh, after the death of one of the register of wills died while he was in office and they had to go back and re-record some of the states in Harford County under an act of the General Assembly in 1802. So okay. all, the, all the states that were done prior to the death of John George Bradford, who was Register of Wills, up until his death in 1800, everything had to be redone um, because there were still open cases when he died uh, and not resolved. So um, so I'll send that to you. Um, send me the name of the Henry ahead. Hedden book also. I might be able to find that at my library to refer to also. And uh, I have one other general right, you question. Can... You know, there was there were census records. Uh, there was a Maryland census in 1776 or 75. Um, why do you suppose he wouldn't 76. appear in that? Because I Some couldn't of it find it. What, what was that? Some of it is missing. Oh, okay. That's why I didn't find in there, because that would have been before his, was that before his death? I can't remember when I said he died. Uh, yeah. yes. he, died in 17, he died in 1777. Yeah. So okay. he should have appeared in there. I actually have the scans of the actual original 1776 census, um, and there are some of it just missing. Um, so... It, whatever reason it uh, it didn't surface, especially when it was uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, the late uh, Guinness Brimball 
uh, transcribed a lot of that uh, back in the early 1900s in a book on uh, uh, Colonial Maryland uh, records. Um, and he basically copied the same stuff that we had and uh, it, it's, for whatever reason, didn't survive. Um, I know. During the revolution, during the revolution um, uh, we did uncover uh, that we do have some other militia list of people who served during the revolution from Harford County uh, that are not appearing in Walter Preston's history of Harford County because the list were obtained by the clerk of the court, but never transferred over uh, when the book was written in 1901. And what so year were the oaths of allegiance? What year were the oaths of allegiance? 78, okay. That would have been too yeah. late. Yeah, well, if you she could send me something. whatever you found, right. that would be terrific. I really appreciate that. Right. He would also sign the, possibly sign the, the Association of Freemen in 1775. Is that available online anywhere? No. We have the originals at the historical society. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And you've got a little bit for me at least, and I'm still searching other Connollys yeah. in the area. So it's one of those type of things where it's like you're kind of, it's in that period of time where it's hit or miss what you're going to find. So Mary, are you ready for the next one? Right. I, I want to finish the one I was talking about beforehand. I apologize. <clears throat> um, we were discussing the Reed family, Stephen Reed, Wilkes County, and then Ashley County, North Carolina. And the fact that they were looking specifically for information on an Elizabeth Reed, who uh, was the grandmother of Stephen Reed. And in, in 1735 in Chowan, North Carolina, was fined for having two mixed race children out of wedlock. And that would be easier to locate information on because court records go back to 1715, but birth, marriage and death records um, are a little bit into the future. Marriage doesn't start till 1747. And um, so when you're, one thing you need to do when you start looking in other areas, uh, other counties, is go to the, their website and try to um, see when their records start and if they had a fire, what records may have been destroyed in the fire. And then that way you'll know if you're running in, you're, you're driving into a brick wall because if, if you have somebody who died in 1840 that you're looking for and they don't start death records till 1913, you may have a bit of a situation. You And when you're looking in foreign countries, you also have to look at the privacy uh, laws. For example, in Germany, uh, birth records are basically private for 110 years and where the records are maintained. In, in Germany, it's townships and um, Canada, it's uh, provinces and townships and different things like that. You're not necessarily looking for a national registration. So in spite of looking for an hour, I was not able to locate any additional information on Tom or Elizabeth Reed and no further information on Stephen in Chowan, North Carolina. Okay. And I'm 
talking. Okay. Nancy. I know you're on here. Um, you were looking into the Lindsay family. Mm -hmm. And um, I have your family chart, but I do not have your question in front of me. I've been feverishly looking for it for the past 15 minutes and it is not here. So can you summarize the question that you had in reference? Yes. I know that Albert Lindsay is my third great grandfather and I have DNA matches that are matching to him. But I've also found another couple that about 10 or 12 matches are leading to this cousin, to this couple. And his name is Jonathan Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to find if there's any relationship between Albert and Jonathan. Um, they're about uh, 20 years difference in their ages. Um, they are for sure on my dad's side. Um, so I'm just trying to see if there's any relationship between those two, um, because I have not been able to find Jonathan's parents' names. I do know that Albert's parents' names, his father's name is Thomas Lindsay, but I cannot find Jonathan's father's name. Okay. Um, Thomas Lindsay, 1778? Ish, yes. Okay. Married to Margaret Brown? Uh, yes. Okay. I found a marriage for them in Scotland. I believe you had Ireland. In February 27th, 1798. But um, we still don't know who their children are, so we don't know if no. um, Jonathan is even part of that family. And that's yeah. what I've been trying to figure out. The only child of Thomas Lindsay and Margaret Brown married in Scotland was Robert Lindsay. That was listed, okay, but as you know, there could have been 14 other kids, but only Robert showed up. Um, the, uh, we, we discussed the fact that it almost looked like you were trying to do a mirror tree. No. I, yeah, I know. You're trying to formulate a relationship, though, and find a common ancestor? If there is one, yes, because I just find it odd that I have these 10 matches, and even my sisters and my half-sister even have these same matches to this Jonathan Lindsay that I have no idea how they fit into my family. Right. And I know you had talked about a, a mirror tree being specific to yourself, but from what I have been understanding, anytime you're trying to connect two um, ancestors together, you use the mirror tree concept to try to build the, the limbs towards each other, basically. And it, it's, it can be very tricky. You have to find aunts, uncles, cousins, and all that other good stuff and, and um, match the, uh, and, and trying to find out what the relationship there is. So you, you've got a, a very complicated little issue here. <laughs> and, uh, well, we're not the only ones trying to figure it out because I've been in contact with some of the other people who are researching Jonathan and who are in his family and mm -hmm. um, they can't figure out who his parents are either. Right. So. And in certain areas, um, let's see, jo Jonathan, was that Ireland? Um, I, I forget. No, Albert I forget. was yes. in Ireland. And you also have to take into account what was happening in the world there. For example, in Ireland, the potato famine and um, different things where 
people may have gotten lost and records just weren't made. And um, so you, you've got quite a few things, um, quite a few obstacles to overcome. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> You're making me, me feel real good. <laughs> I, I, well, it, when you're basically you're trying to connect an ancestry between two different people, and one in Ireland and one on uh, Ontario, and there could be. Well, they both ended up in Canada, right? So they both ended up there, and. Um, so, I mean, they may not even be related. I just find it interesting that I have, you know, all these people going to that Lindsay family, all these DNA matches that go to this Lindsay family. Plus, I have my own that, and they're for sure on my dad's side, for sure lived in Canada. And so, um, you know, around the same place in Ontario, it wasn't like, you know, somebody was in Saskatchewan and somebody was in Ontario. You know, they're sort of, in the same general vicinity. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, you might find your answers in the naturalization paperwork or the citizenship paperwork. Uh, I, I know Canada does have that. Um, with Ontario, it'll probably be in French. Uh, but uh, there, yeah, Canada has a lot of privacy rules, and yes. it's very specific to the location of records. So, yeah, I haven't given up yet. I've got to figure out how these 10, 15 people match me. So, thank you, Mary. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Okay, Chris. Yes. Are you done? Uh, um, I think so. Okay. I have to look. I forget. Is there anyone on here who submitted a question that we haven't covered? Yeah, it looks like. The... Is there anyone that has a question that we haven't covered that that they didn't ask one that they want to ask a question now? I haven't received a question or an answer. Maybe. Okay, who's who's speaking? Debbie O'Neill. Debbie O'Neill. Okay. Um, what was your question? I wanted to know the parents' names of my second great grandfather, Harry Harker. Ah, okay. Yes, I did work with on you. That that's an interesting. Um, yes. Now, the one paperwork I found had Catherine possibly listed as Elizabeth? Yes, that that's her name. It was Elizabeth. Okay, because you had Catherine on here. I know. I got all confused when I was writing because I was trying to break my other brick wall when I was writing that letter. So I'm sorry. I, I did send a, another one with okay. the correct information. But. I, I did not get that. Um, okay. This one, I I did not put in a full hour, but basically I, I ran out of time because the class was coming up. Um, we uh, So I need to do a little bit more work on this. Okay. Um, I did find, and like I said, uh, Fountain and Catherine Raritan in Elizabeth, Indiana, yeah. but then they seemed to leave there. Right, right. right. Okay. You know, they left Indiana and they ended up in Kansas, in El Dorado, right. Kansas. And uh, that's where things got a little difficult. Um, I could not find him listed as Fountain Harker in El Dorado. No, he went by Perry Harker in El Dorado. Okay. But and, I mean, his parents, I have no idea. He came from Ohio, or he was born in Ohio. Ohio. Right. And then and, the next thing you find is his marriage certificate to Elizabeth Raritan, and then you find him in Indiana and then in Kansas. Right. But I don't know anything about his family. 
Right. And um, I started with a search in Ohio. And I basically did not have anything uh, appear. It may be something that needs a little bit more uh, research. And uh, I have your phone number. So once we give this the the full attention that it deserves, and and if we find anything, I'll give you a call. Um, Okay. I apologize. We we just no. basically ran out of time. No, I appreciate it. Like I said, it was he is one of my remaining brick walls. So you know, eventually I'll get it chipped off. But I yeah. thank you for your help, your time and help. I appreciate it. I mean, do you know anything about his, anything about his parents? That nothing. Nothing. No, because he died in Kansas um, in 1902, which is before they started doing the death certificates. Right. And it's not listed on his marriage certificate to Elizabeth, or at least not on the one I found online. Right. So I have no idea what his parents' names are. None. Okay. So. Okay. And I appreciate what you helped. Thank you. No problem. Uh, a lot of times with, again, with brick walls, it's, it's the availability of records. It's before records were kept or right. the loss of records from fire, hurricane, tornado, whatever. Um, and, uh, but you've got to be able to look, look outside the box, like with um, Deb, record i couldn't find anything on the death of um the wife but when i found out that there was a railroad pension i knew i couldn't get the information but she was the one that could possibly get all the information and hit pay dirt he had a railroad pension Deb Record. Is that Deb Record? Yeah, for Perry Harker. He had a. No, 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 no. Oh, no, for no. somebody else. Okay. Yeah, Deb Record, not Deb O'Neill. <laughs> okay. And, um, but look at, look at their occupations, where they worked, um, the, the places that they moved. Look at the history of the places they moved. And, um, Look at newspapers. Yeah, I have a whole bunch on in the newspapers because I subscribe to newspapers.com. But I mean, like I found out that him and her had separated and, you know, he didn't want to have to pay her bills, but the court decided he had to. Mm-hmm. So the, another good place to find uh, newspapers is the Library of Congress. If you go yeah. on the Library of Congress Um, online digital library uh, for newspapers. You can search newspapers all over the United States there too. Okay. Um, I'll keep, I'll keep chipping away at the wall. I appreciate it though. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I have, I looked at the, like, I think it's an 1837 map of Harford County. It may be a little later and I can find a great, 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 grandfather's initials down on Harford Furnace for his area. But how do you go into the land records to find uh, any more detail about place and space um, where they might properties? The Aegis over the years has various sales and purchases from the family. Um, But I, I, you mentioned the land records a couple of times, Chris. And I'm just wondering how you, where you start with, or how you start accessing that information. Uh, the information uh, out of the land records, uh, like I said before, you, you, you can do that from the comfort of your home. You do not need to go to the courthouse. Um, the website is, uh, I'll put it in the um, 
uh, in the chat so everybody can see it. Um, actually, let me share my. Give me one second. I can share my screen. Okay. Hold on. Is it a county record? Chris? Ah, oh, here we come. Okay. What I brought on the screen is the, uh, is the website for the Maryland land records. Um, and it's uh, www.mdlandrec.net. Uh, is what you type into your browser. Uh, probably the best browser to use is probably Google, Google Chrome. Um, the other thing is make sure you have, a, for example, an Acrobat uh, PDF reader on your computer. Um, uh, that is the way that the actual land records will actually come up on your screen. Um, if you don't have a login and password, uh, you create one, it'll then ask you how many counties that you want to have access to. And I would suggest that you just click the all button and do all of them, including the city of Baltimore. You don't, you don't need to just do Harford County. You can do all of them. It doesn't cost you a dime. Um, when you bring up the, after you create the password and log in and stuff, what you'll do is up at the left hand corner, you're, you have a drop down menu. You come to Harford County. You click Harford County. Uh, it'll then give you this menu. Uh, over here in the middle, it says jump to new volume. Uh, that's if you already know the book and the page number of the land record that you want to look for. The clerk is the clerk's initials, the clerk of the court. The book is the book number. And then, of course, you have the page number. Um, if it is a recent record in Harford County, all of that is computerized uh, digitally going back to 1970 up until April the 12th, which was two days ago. Okay. Uh, if the record is before that time, over on the left-hand side, you have a button that says active indices. And the first thing that comes up is uh, land record index original 1773 to 1959. You click search. That then gives you the index from 1773 to 1924, and it splits it alphabetically, uh, breaks it down. And then from there, you click that book. It then gives you a two to three page index uh, with a code. Uh, uh, I'll go here to A for a second. Let's see if it wants to be grumpy on me. Uh, oh, it's actually working tonight. Um, so what will happen is when you bring this up, uh, at the beginning, when you click the A, it, it will, uh, let's see, let me go over here. When that view one, it'll actually make it bigger so you can actually see it better. And of course my, oh, there it goes. My computer wants to be. Ah less cooperative. So what I'll do is I'll give you this page. So the first, the first two letters over here, and it goes across 
and goes down to whatever, whichever one, and then you go, say it's AAR, you go to page number one, you go back over here, and where it says page, you type in one, it hit enter, and it goes to that page. For the index, And there's the actual uh, AARs over on the right-hand side. It gives you the clerk's initials, the book number, and the page number. And then that's where you use uh, the book volume thing that I first showed you. And then that'll take you to the actual record in the land record book. So all those have been digitized. There are cases sporadically where an image isn't there for whatever reason, all you do is uh, it gives you a prompt to notify the archives and they'll upload the image back up so that it's actually put back. But that's kind of very sparse that that's actually happening. So you're able to blow these things up as big as you want to be able to read them. Um, some of the writing is very light, but you're able to um, Nine times out of ten, you, you you should be fine reading it on the screen. Now, if you go to print it out, that's a totally different story. So, um, so there you have three hundred some years of land records at your you. disposal from your uh, living room couch. Thank so, you. One other quick you, question: so A couple of my relatives were married in Baltimore City, and I've looked at the marriage index, and for the Harford County ones, they all say C M. And the number, which is code county microfish or microfilm. So would I come back to use a couple of people mentioned looking at marriage records or indexes, but would I come back to the historic society or stay at the uh, state level to try to find more detail? Or is that I just got the, the marriage record? Uh, the marriage records for what for what county? Harford. Okay, uh, from 1777 until 1865, all it is is a marriage ledger. Uh, we, the only thing that we have uh, at the Historical Society is the transcription book that John Livesey and the late Helene Davis wrote, the actual book uh, is on microfilm at the state archives. Where the actual original is may be at the uh, at the courthouse, but I'm not 100% sure. All that's going to tell you is the bride, the groom, the date of the license, and maybe the minister. After 1865, uh, starting in 1866 until 1990, uh, we have all of the marriage license that were the court copies that were uh, sent back to the courthouse uh, at the historic society. All of that, all of those licenses have been indexed by the groom by year, well, by year, by the groom, but, and then in alphabetical order. So all those are in files. Um, the pre-1900 stuff is uh, together, uh, the stuff 1900 until 1990 is all uh, single year by the groom's last name. Um, Thank you. There is so, an index on line. Uh, if you go to, Harvard. right, if you go to harfordhistory.org and when you get to the front or the website, you'll see uh, research click on that and then click on online research and then you'll see past perfect click on that and that will take you to uh, information on marriage indexes and different infor different information we keep on file at the um, historical society so thank you thank you won't necessarily see the records uh but you'll see that we have something on, on that name. 
I just put it out a, a lot that under helps. that category last night. Thank you so much. And Chris, do you have the, a the question? index that's on? Go ahead. The, the, the index that's on past perfect for the marriage records for Harford County only gives the bride and groom's name and the, and the date. However, it only goes, we've only posted up to 1931, but we actually have the records to 1990. So uh, two you. people posted question. Uh, Mary B posted a, she posted a question uh, and I'll share that with you, Mary, uh, about uh, William Stewart who lived in uh, Hill and Farms in Baltimore. Um, or John Welsh in Goshen, uh, New right. York. Um, so she, she had submitted a question. Uh, and then Deb asked, do the Maryland records include parts of Sussex County, Delaware, that were considered to be Maryland prior to settlement of Maryland, Delaware land boundaries? Uh, boundaries? Um, yes. Um, that is... Um, th those would be among, partially among some of the county records along the eastern shore. So it would be the, the, the lower eastern shore where some of that information is. Okay, and you have the question from Mary Bolton? Yes, and I'll, uh, it's in the chat and I'll uh, I'll send it. Uh, I'll take a picture of it, and send it to you. Okay, I, I'm I've got it. Um, the immigration or any info on John Welsh from Ireland. I found the certificate yeah, from or his William son. Stewart. Uh, the other one was uh, yeah. Johan. Groot Von from Mary Bolton. Okay. Okay. Also, something about a William Stewart from Hilton Farms in Baltimore. In Baltimore. No, nothing about that. I had uh, Johan Rootford, and she okay. was trying to verify that he was born 1752 yeah. in Prussia. Germany. Okay. So, well, she said we can we, we can look at either into either one. So. Okay. And uh, did Laura submit something to you, Laura Cooper? Yes, and I text her back. Yes, I text them back, and I'm still trying to resolve it. <laughs> can I make a quick comment? Sure. Um about sure. the past perfect files. Uh, I just discovered those recently. And um, since we're talking on the subject of brick walls, you didn't help me solve a brick wall, but you helped me through those land records that are posted out there on the patents and the unpatented lands that you can go to the Maryland archives directly. And you've got a list of them on that map maker. I was able to find Correct. the person who I thought was my brick wall and discovered that unfortunately he is not. But at least I have one proven that I can no lot that I can stop searching for. So I appreciate that you had those particular lists and links because it helped me to discover something. Okay. And we we want you to know that we're working very hard to get those updated. However, Due to COVID, we have lost a year in um, with volunteers working on getting these indexed and um, accessioned and filed and everything. So there, there's a very large um, stack of paperwork waiting for the volunteers when they get back. And um, what we're what we're looking at due due to COVID um, is. Uh, probably not opening up for a while for um, the public. And we have taken advantage of the time that we were closed due to COVID to start some 
uh, construction work. So right now, the, the historical society is in a bit of flux, okay, because we have um, the windows boarded up. They're taking out the windows for a restoration project, and the windows are gone for two weeks, and they're taking them out in stages, and then they come back in. Plus, we are also building a museum in the first part of the uh, historical society, the lobby where you walk in. And so if you can imagine, everything that was in the lobby and, and all those places is now in the historical society. So we're, we're working um, around a lot of obstacles. And part of the problem right now with opening for um, volunteers or researchers, there's no place to go. You can't safely distance. Um, um, and so we have to, we, we have to rearrange things for the construction and then we have to um, get the volunteers in there first and start working on different things. But um, I'm not quite sure when there'll be opening our numbers in Maryland have gone up. And um, so we're, we're always reviewing things and looking for um, a possibility of a window to open up in. But we want you to know that um, if there is something that you need somebody to look at, um, I, I've looked up different records and sent information to um, people I know Chris has and, and a few other people, um, you can always feel free to ask us. Uh, we, um, we will see what we can do. And um, there's always research by mail. Uh, that's where you send in a question and we send it to a uh, volunteer who does the research for it's $30, $30 an hour. And, um, We've had a lot of people doing research that way. So um, that's available. And um, a lot of people have had success with that. And in fact, I think, Chris, you've done a few of them, haven't you? Or worked on I've some research. By you. Do I? I've done a lot of them. Okay. So um, there, there's, there's always a ways to find the information that you may be looking for. Uh, we apologize about the way things are right now, but especially with the construction, um, it's, it's a little bit um, crowded <laughs> in the historical society. So we're still getting things worked out. And um, is there anybody else with any questions? Comments. I keep hearing all the peepers behind you, Chris. Mary, I Chris, I just want to thank you for the work okay. that you did. Oh. For all of us. That was nice. Appreciate it. Any genealogist loves a good mystery. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're doing the same family over and over again and somebody throws something interesting in front of you and it's, it's like Christmas, you know, and I know Chris enjoys it. And um, I, I had fun with a lot of these and uh, we, we want to help you find your ancestors and know your story and where you came from. So uh I I'm uh, since I'm out of state, I am now going to be joining because I'm discovering more and more of my ancestors seem to have come from Harford County. So I'll be sending in a membership. Oh, that would be I wonderful. I really appreciate it. Um, I can't wait to get out there whenever you get opened again and do some actual research at your facilities. Really appreciate your help. Oh, and you will have so much fun. Uh, we that one of the greatest things about Harford County is, is when you're researching and pull, getting documents, you are a lot of times holding the actual document. And that is just so thrilling to a lot of people. Um, if you enjoyed today and 
are not a member and want to make a contribution for the um, production, uh, there will there is a donate button on our website, and you can feel free to make a donation to cover the work that went into researching and organizing and um, the production of this class. We are going to be planning more classes in the near future. Uh, Chris and I have to get together our own subjects. And, and now that we've seen some of the problems people are having, we can work on that. And uh, we will be glad when we're not talking to our computers sitting in our house, but talking to real people at the Historical Society. And we hope you enjoyed this class. So, Chris? Yeah. Another thing is if anyone here has any suggestions for uh, future topics, to please put it in the chat box mm -hmm. and uh, or email or email Mary at the Historical Society uh, yes. at the email that you sent your inquiries to, and yes, we'll a uh, consider those in the future. It's admn at harfordhistory.org. And if I can't answer your question, um, I'll make sure to get it out to someone who can. We have amazing people there, not only Chris, but Walter and, and uh, um, Henry and different people who are experts in their areas that we will make sure you have direct access. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice seeing everybody. Have a good night.